Take your Bible, turn to the book of Mark, chapter 4. Uh, I, I'm, I am just marveled at uh, the songs we sang this morning and what David said. I did ask him if you've been looking at my sermon notes. And I'm not kidding you. Um, I mentioned this during Sunday school, so I'm not going to reiterate much of it. But uh, Saturday night is, I sort of, if I have a sermon in mind, I do the final touches on it Saturday. But that's just how I've learned to work over the years. Have it fresh in my mind and my heart. I've tried writing sermons early in the week, and usually by the time I get to the end of the week, they just don't seem right. And um, so anyway, um, I was had a lot of stuff going on on my computer. I was trying to get two videos out from Kenya and trying to master them so we can get them out on the Internet. And the storm came and cut our power off. And um, for, there for a while, we was all gathered up, bunched up over at Sterling and Gloria's house because they got a basement. I told Alicia to get the kids to come over here to the church. Um, and mom was, I called mom, she was fine. She got down in her basement. Um, but it's just when you see storms like that coming, by experience, we know you don't mess with them. Uh, you could lose your life. And um, so anyway, um, I had some ideas for what I was going to do this morning. Uh, but the storms just really, the storms and some other things that happened, it just really got my attention. And it wasn't until about 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning uh, that the Lord finally just let me put all these notes down. And when I say notes, you know it's just Scripture. Uh, but I, I marvel at the Word of God. I do. I marvel at this book. God gives me a word to look up in the scriptures and I'm just stunned that other preachers don't do this because the sermons write themselves. I'm telling you, you spend a little time in a verse of scripture and the Holy Ghost to give you 15 dozen sermons right then and there. And you'll just think, my goodness, there's nothing else in the Bible to preach but this. And it just made things that I do much easier for me, but it's a blessing. And I learned so much last night. So I'm going to share it with you this morning. Mark chapter 4, if you would, verse 35. Uh, we're going to read Mark chapter 4 and we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 8. They both are basically the same thing, but they say it in just a little bit different way. Uh, but it's this question that the disciples asked Jesus, Carest thou not that we perish? Years ago, Brother Reg Kelly came and he preached a message here. And he said, it's the dumbest question that anybody's ever asked in the Bible. They asked God, carest thou not that we perish? Of course I care whether or not you perish. I came down here for that reason. I care. I care. And if nobody else cares, I care. If everybody else casts you aside, I will never do that. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be your comforter. I will be your guide. I will be your help. I will be your shield. I will be everything. Those of you who have lost husbands in this life, God is the replacement for that husband. God is the one who will provide for you. God is the one who will care for you. God is the one who will see every tear that you cry. God is the one who will understand better than a husband ever did. Amen, ladies? Yeah, hey, yeah the ladies back there going, yeah. <laughs> I know we don't get it, but there's Jesus. Huh? Losing the wife, too. Um, but all of these things, God is the replacement for that. God is a replacement for that. So they go to Jesus and they ask the question, Carest thou not that we perish? And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. There arose a great storm of wind. We saw that last night. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose. And he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And I'll be honest with you. I have great fears often. Great fears. Storms bring them. And they never used to. In my younger days, I was adventurous. And I wanted to see, I wanted to live through something that was bad. For I don't know why, but uh, I wanted to see how bad things can get. You go through a hot summer, we remember days when we had 115 degree weather. And that was bad. That's about the record here for, for Jefferson County. And then, who, we, if you've been around here long enough, you remember the, the uh, blizzard of 1982. 24 inches of thunder snow. We remember those days. And we say, boy, that was bad. And in my youth, I didn't think anything of it. I never thought about the dangers of it. never thought about the consequences of it. But I will tell you that, and some of you know this, having been electrocuted, lightning is not something that I enjoy anymore. And when I see lightning striking outside, it does something in me and I don't like it. Uh, it is probably the nearest to being shell-shocked or what they call post-traumatic stress uh, that I think I've ever come. But when uh, Lindsay called me last night and said, Dad, you need to get over here. Uh, it looks like a, there's a tornado somewhere close by. I was watching the lightning and I'm going, I'm not going outside. I did. I told Lindsay, I said, I'm not going outside. I'll watch the storm from here, but I'm not going outside. Then I got a storm thunder uh, tornado warning that on my phone that said, in your area, leave now, find cover. Well, then I took it seriously. But I, I don't like them like I used to. Because I have gone through things that's shaped me and molded me and made me different than I used to be. And I will say to you this morning, as I go through these notes, that's part of the reason why we had them to begin with. Is that at the end of it, it's supposed to make us different. Carest thou not that we perish. And then in Luke chapter 8, verse 22, Now it came to pass on a certain day, that he went into a ship with his disciples and said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. That's the Sea of Galilee. It's a huge, huge lake. And, he's, and they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there were come down a storm of wind on the lake. And I'm telling you, being in a storm is one thing. Being in a boat on a, during a storm is probably the worst feeling in the world. Especially when you're in a little John boat on Mississippi River, like my dad and I was one time, Scared me to death. Because not only are you afraid of the storm, now you're afraid of drowning. And there came a storm of wind on the lake and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. See, it's real. The storms are real. Or they wouldn't have near the effect. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commanded even the winds and water, and they obey him. This must be God. I added that in. But that's what would be in there. That's what they were getting at. What manner, what kind of man is this? There is no man that I've ever seen. They could just speak to the water. Peace, be still. And boom, the water and the winds, hail, rain, everything obeys His voice. Somebody say amen. So do you think there's devils that are more powerful than the voice of God? When God can speak, either God can speak and the whirlwinds bring, bring forth, or God can speak and the whirlwinds cease. Either way. Mankind does not have the ability to stop a tornado or we would stop them. So ask yourself the question, does God care? What is the purpose for the storms that I endure? What is the purpose for the hardships in life that I go through? What is the purpose of these things in my life? Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And turn to Psalms. Psalm 148, God's purpose in the storms. And remember now we're looking for things I misspelled because it was at 2 o'clock in the morning and I was working on my tablet. It's the only thing I had a battery in. 
Psalm 148, verse, verse 5. I'm not kidding you. As I began to go through these verses, I mean, I can just see the Word of God coming to reality and showing me things that I've seen in my life. And now I see them a little bit clear, and I hope you see them clear this morning. Psalm 148, verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For He commanded, and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. It is God's intention that you live forever. It is God's purpose that you live forever and be with Him forever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. That means when God says it, it will happen. It will do exactly what God said it will do. And there isn't anything, no power in this universe, no power in heaven or hell that can stop the Word of God from doing what the Word of God was sent forth to do. So verse 7 says, Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps, fire and hail, snow. And I, I would say in, in this message on storms, I would say snowstorms, ice storms, sleet storms, hail storms, rain storms, lightning storms, um, thunder, tornadoes, hurricanes. Any kind of storm that you see in this natural world has a has a spiritual uh, connotation to it or, or a, a spiritual meaning behind it. Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, watch this, fulfilling His, what? His Word. In other words, the storms that you encountered were sent forth by God to you, to your area. We often wonder, why do certain people die in tornadoes? Why, why? Some people say, why does a living God allow things like that to kill people? People die. It is a point another man wants to die. Everybody's got to die. We're all going to die of something. Some die of sickness. That's tragic. Some die of disease. That's tragic. Some die in accidents. That's tragic. Some die of what they call in the insurance world, acts of Now, the insurance company may say that just means an accident. But those of us who believe the Scriptures know that there is no such thing. That if it's an act of God and He sent it forth fulfilling His Word, He's got a purpose in it. Do you believe that? Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, they all fulfill His Word. So that the, even the dragons... Even the dragons fulfill His word. They accomplish God's goal and His purpose in your life. Job chapter 21. One of those purposes, turn to Job chapter 21, is purification. Have you ever noticed, after a, uh, let's say, a, a mid-spring or a mid-summer thunderstorm, a real good, good thunderstorm that comes up, passes over, and goes by, what, what do you notice about the air after a good thunderstorm. What do you notice about it? Fresh. What is it? Keep giving me other adjectives. Crisp. Clean. With no caffeine. Right? Yeah, enjoyable. Amen. <sighs> you know why? With every lightning strike, it's full of ions. And ions latch on to contaminants in the air. Dust, germs, different things, like pollen. And they either fall to the ground because of the rain or they're blown away with the wind. This is why companies years ago started making ionizers for houses for home use. Uh, companies will send ionizer. They, when we, we had the fire up in the balcony, they brought in a great big massive ionizer that exchanged the air in this room and ionized it. And as it ionized it, all the carbon particles from the smoke and everything like that were pulled out of the air. And the air that was sent out was now clean. The purpose, one of the purposes for these storms is purification. Job 21, 14. Therefore they say unto God, depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy... Ways. What I mentioned about Portland, Oregon is exactly that. Those people, I, the video I watched the other day, somebody had pulled a video from the 1950s. It was a promotional film made to promote Portland, Oregon. And you know what they promoted back in 1950 about Portland? Not that it was weird. Not that it was full of drugs. 
but that it was a clean city. It was a beautiful city. It was a city full of churches. It was a city full of, uh, full of um, uh, art and, uh, and symphonies and music. And it was a, a, a great opportunity with great schools to educate your children in. And it was like the dreamland. Everybody moved there. So what happened? All the stupid liberals moved there. And it, it's in the process of its own self-destruction. Now, why? Because they desire not the knowledge of God's ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve Him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? People don't want to hear about our God. They don't care about our God. They don't care about the gospel that we preach. Lo, verse 16. Lo, there is good. Lo, their good is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. Verse 17. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? That's his light. His inner light. And I have this idea, this verse here. I think, I think there is a light that lights every man that comes into the earth. John chapter 1. And you know what I think God's going to do? I think he's going to put the candle, that light, out. Of every man in this world who's not saved. And they will abide in darkness. The count, how often is the candle of the wicked put out? And how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. They are as, here it is now, look at this verse. They are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. God knew about the ions in a thunderstorm long before science figured it out. Amen? God says, that's why I designed them. The air gets nasty and dirty and it gets filthy. The, God knows the best way to clean it out is to send some lightning down, send some rain down, clear the air. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the stubble of the wicked, I'm going to take the chaff of their unrighteous deeds, and I'm going to blow them all away. I'm going to clean this place up. Somebody say amen. Somebody needs to go look in my office. Oh, it ain't mine. It's grandkids. There's candy wrappers all over the floor. There's a little baby doll in there. Stuff scraping off the couch onto the floor in there. I need a thunderstorm to go through my office and clean it up. But think about the purification. Think about how the storms of life bring purification in our lives. Think about how we decide we're going to do things our way. And we're going to try to fulfill our purposes. Did you know you can serve the right God for the wrong reason? And let me illustrate it this way. Uh, Chris, suppose you had a favorite tool that you liked. Okay, now there were more expensive ones at the store. But this one tool, you really liked it. You liked how it worked. It fit your hand well. It operated well. You took good care of it. And that was your favorite tool. So a guy comes to you and says, Chris, I need such and such tool. And now you probably should say, what do you need it for? I'm not saying that you would say it, even though I think you would. I said, you probably should say, what are you going to use it for? You know what we're doing? We're checking the guy's motives out. If he says, you know, I got this one thing here. I just, needs, I just need it real quick. I'll bring it back. Okay, bring it back. And if you find him to be trustworthy, you'll, you'll let him use your nice, pretty tool. But if he says, now, I'm going to come over there. I need, I need that tool. I'll tell you what I'll do. Just so there's no, you know, questions afterward, I'll pay you the full price for it. No matter if I bring it back or not, that, that money is yours. I would still ask, what are you going to use it for? Because he might say, I want to see how long it lasts. I'm going to put a camera by it and put this on YouTube. See how long it lasts with me driving my truck over it. Would you give him the tool? No. See, he's using the tool and he's going to pay for it. But this, this, this one you like, you want to keep. And no amount of money would buy this tool again from the store, right? Okay, I'm making this up as I go, so go along with me. But the idea is a man's motivations and a man's um, reasonings behind why he does what he does matters. I could stand up here and preach 
all these sermons to you, but if my real intention is to lead you to stray or if my real intention is to just get money out of your pockets or whatever, then it doesn't matter what the message is. My intentions are wrong. And God has a way of sending storms in our lives to purify and clean up our intentions. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, is what Jesus said. And one of the things that God will do is he will, he will clear up and clean up, number one, an unclean life. And motives that are not right for God and for man. Motives that do not match the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And love thy neighbor as thyself. You can be in the actions of serving God and serving man. But if your heart is not right in those actions, then your actions are not right either. And the storms of life will come and they will purify those things in us. We may wonder why these, we're going through these things. Hey, God's just trying to do some cleaning up that needs to take place on us. Amen. Let me move on. Here it is. Isaiah 29. He says the same thing. Moreover, the multitude of thy strangers shall be like small dust. And the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. Yea, it shall be at an instant suddenly. In other words, they just move away quickly. How quick is lightning? Boom. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder and with earthquake and great noise with storm and tempest and flame of devouring fire. All of this has to do with purification. Getting the chaff off of our lives. The chaff is this flesh that you and I are covered in and its motives and its deeds are always going to be full of iniquity. And the longer we live for God, and the longer we serve God, and the longer we try to uh, live for God and do what's right, God will send the storms to clean up and purify our lives. He said in Job 27, 13, This is the portion of a wicked man with God, and the heritage of oppressors, which they shall receive of the Almighty. And he, we skip on down to verse 21. Here's what he says about the wicked man. The east wind carrieth him away, and he departeth. And as a storm hurleth him out of his place. Think of it like this. From time to time, we'll have bad influences. From time to time, we'll be following people. Or have friends that are not good for us. They'll lead us astray. Or by their actions and their deeds, they will lead us into sins that we never before participated in. How many children growing up in decent homes led into indecent lives because of the people they were hanging around? Amen to that. Young people, you listen to that. I mentioned in Sunday school, if, if, if all of us, or just a while ago, if all of us old folks could just drive it into you young people, the heartache, the pain, the suffering, the scars that you carry with you to this day of unrighteous, wicked deeds in your youth. You'd prob if, you, if you knew what was coming, you'd probably say, God, uh, kill me now. I don't want to go through that. But let me tell you, we have a faithful God and he has a way of getting rid of even bad influences. He'll use a storm. I couldn't tell you how many times God used some sort of storm in me. To where I finally would turn to God and say, OK, God, what are you saying? What are you trying to get at? Psalm 107. This falls under the category of the acts of God. And again, the way the world puts it, and by the way, the, the phrase acts of God are still in insurance policies. They're in legal papers. Uh, but they don't, they don't have the bite. They don't have the meaning that they used to have years ago in this country. Uh, the reason why we have that phrase is that at, at one time people believed that things happen only by the hand of God. And there, there were some things just outside of our ability 
or man's ability to do or man's ability to stop. Uh, if, you, if you live in an apartment and the apartment gets blown away in a tornado, you cannot sue the landlord for a flawed design in the apartment or how shabby it was built or whatever. You cannot sue the landlord because he did not build it to withstand tornadoes because we know by nature that there isn't much that can withstand a tornado. That once a tornado takes its mind, especially if it's a mile long, then there's nothing that can stop it and nothing that will survive a tornado that big. And so you cannot go after someone because your property is gone now and your house is gone and you rented it from a landlord and he should have prepared it to face a tornado because that is an act of God. It's outside of his, watch this now, it's outside of his ability to control. You know what we don't like? Things outside of our ability to control. Now, look at this. Psalm 107, verse 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare His works with rejoicing. Watch this now. He's drawn your attention to people who work and live on ships because they see storms that even we here in the Midwest would never see. Storms out on the North Atlantic, some of the most... Vi storms around the, uh, Cape Horn in South America, some of the most violent, tempestuous waves and winds and rain that, at, that can be seen on this planet is in those places. And how many, uh, how many mariners over the course of the thousands of years that people have tried ships going back and forth across the northern Atlantic, go back and across, across the lower places of uh, South America, have lost their lives to the sea simply because they endured or tried to endure a storm that no man was able to endure. So he says in verse 23, they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. So I, I think it could be said that those of you who believe and trust in God and have faced the storms and faced terrible things in your life, this family that I mentioned uh, down in Alabama that is now struggling through the ordeal of the loss of a six-year-old grandson because of a... Um, an accident, a silly thing that a boy does, playing around a ditch. I played around hundreds of ditches. Fell in one of them one time. Uh, he fell in some kind of ditch and drowned, and there's no bringing him back. We don't get six-year-old boys back from drowning like that. Now they have to deal with this. They have to go through this. It's the people who have worked on ships and the people who have seen storms like this that can have the greatest impact in their life. Because they've been through it. How'd you get through it? I wouldn't have. If it hadn't been for the Lord. Verse 25. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the ways thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are out at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And He bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm. Listen, if there was a fulfillment of prophecy in Jesus saying, Peace be still. It's right here in Psalm 107. Look at it. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are what? What was, it, what was that word He said? Peace be you might want to mark that in your Bible. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them out unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. An act of God is where God takes your life and takes things so that they are completely out of your control. And we don't like that. 
But what God is forcing us to do is trust Him. And only Him. I like this, proud control. Isaiah 28, we're going to do some proud control. That's not bad for 2 o'clock in the morning, come up with something like that, amen? That is pretty good. I was nearly at my wit's end, but... Isaiah 28, verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride. Ask yourself the question, do I have pride in me? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. To the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. Now verse 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one. Now, I've looked at this verse in the prophetic idea, in other words, looking at the future, and I see in this a picture of the Antichrist, the beast, the one who's coming. And I see him being described here, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one. I think that's speaking of a particular person, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. So God has this evil storm, this man of sin, the son of perdition. God has, God has all the liberals in this country overturning and upsetting the balance that's in our nation to where now things are topsy-turvy, they're upside down. Good is bad, bad is good. Drugs are wonderful. Living clean is bad. That's the... That's the, the nature of what is destroying this country is that we love sin and we've made sin every type of sin. We have made it, well, I'll say the liberals have made it into something that is to be enjoyed, something that is to be done. They're trying to teach it in the youngest ages possible to our children. And you know what? God sent them. Listen. Here we, here we are, we have the Word of God, the King James Bible, we believe this Bible, we, we have rested upon this Bible, we have the, the truth of the knowledge of the Word of God, we've got the truth of salvation, we've got the truth about the blood of Christ, the deity of Christ, we are true in all of these doctrines that we hold dear. And if we're not careful, we'll get so cocky and so prideful and so arrogant about what it is that we stand on, what it is we believe, and I've seen it, I've seen it all my life, I've practiced it before. And God says, you know what? You're too proud. I'm going to upset your apple cart. And God would use the most wildcat, liberal, devil that I think I've ever faced in my life. God would use somebody like that to bring me down a few notches where I need to be. In fact, down on my knee. In fact, down on my face where I need to be. God will use those people like that. And this destroying storm, this mighty one, God says, I'm going to send him, I'm going to turn him loose. Verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet. And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valleys, and the things that you are proud of, or the things that you hold the most pride in, shall be a fading flower, and as the hasty fruit before the summer, which when he, he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. And that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. In other words, he's saying God is going to remove your pride in the things that you hold dear and the things that are precious to you and the things that you proudly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Boast yourself over on other people. The things that you do to put other people down. God will use them. God will use the wicked of this earth. To bring you down to your knees. To humble you. To teach you that there's only one crown. And that crown doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the king of kings. 
Then Ezekiel 13. I think I'm done after this. Ezekiel 13. Turn there. Foundation discovery. You've heard me say this many times before. But it bears repeating again this morning. Because I can't think of anything else to say. But I've been in this church a long time. I've been in church a long time. I've been around fairly conservative people all my life. And yet I've seen out of those people some of the biggest hypocrites that I think could possibly be found. To me, the hypocrite is not someone who goes to some liberal far left church where they don't believe in the gospel, they don't believe half the Bible, they don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, they don't believe a lot of that stuff. The hypocrite is not to be found in those churches because they're only, they are only believing the way that they act and think outside of that church. In other words, there's a reason why you, there's a reason why you are liberal. If you're liberal, there's a reason why you're liberal. You're liberal because you like sin and you, and if you can give everybody else a free pass on their sin in their life, it will not make you feel bad when you go out and sin. In other words, if you can turn on the side of all the sodomites and all the transgenders and everything else that's wrong and liberal and leftist in this country, if you can turn on the side of that, then you don't look so bad. And you and your unrighteous, wicked deeds seem to get a free pass because everybody else is wicked. And I've seen in fundamentalist churches, fundamentalist ministries, fundamentalist movements, some of the grossest examples of hypocrisy that can ever be seen. Why? Why is it so bad in fundamentalist churches? Because we believe that the Word of God abides in us and as time goes on, it drives sin out of our life. As time goes on, it purifies us. As time goes on, it cleans us. As time goes on, we end up loving God more, hating ourselves more. We end up loving our neighbor, even our wrong neighbors, our wicked neighbors, our liberal neighbors. We end up loving them because that's the great commandment that Christ gave to us. We end up loving people as time goes on. That's what we're supposed to be. But when fundamentalists and conservative people go against that, and they start, again, they start uh, boasting of themselves and their own deeds and their own short haircuts and their long dresses and their long hair and everything else that we say that a Christian must have in order to be a real Christian. All of these holiness things and everything like that that don't really amount to a hill of beans because you still are a sinner in your life. Say amen. You still have a wicked, hell-deserving nature in you that a lot of times... That hypocrisy coming out of people that it should never have been in to begin with just resonates in me as probably the worst that can be seen in this world. So God sends storms. Massive amounts. They, they said uh, there was places yesterday got, what, baseball size hail? Softball maybe? That's hail this big. Hailstones this big. That'll tear your car up. That'll tear your boat up. That'll tear your roof off, tear your house apart. That'll, that'll destroy your garden. That, that'll kill some of your livestock. I mean, it'll just destroy just about everything you got. And when all of that's gone, and then... You turn away from God, you turn away from church, you turn away from the Bible, you turn away from prayer. Because your motives weren't right, your heart wasn't right, you were a hypocrite. And you, t and you were living a lie in front of everybody. You had built a wicked foundation under you and then you built on top of it. But it wasn't going to last, it never was. So in Ezekiel 13, he addresses this issue and he says, Mine hand shall be upon the prophets, verse 9, that see vanity and that divine lies. 
They shall not be in the assembly of my people. In other words, they're not even saved. Isn't that something? To be a member of a conservative, fundamental, King James, Bible-believing, preaching church and not even be saved. It happens a lot. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. In other words, their name's not written in the book. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. What is that, Matthew? That's lime that has not been kilned. Or as they say down St. Jen, kills. It's lime that has not gone through the fire. Furnace. Furnace will work. So they built it, but they built it anyway. Because it looks good. And it makes them look good. And if I, I know how preachers think. Preachers see an empty church, all they see is, oh, I gotta fill those pews. I gotta fill those pews. And the reason why he's gotta fill those pews, he believes in his heart, he's, it's, it's all ego toward him. I gotta fill those pews so that people will think of me as a good pastor and a good preacher. If I can get people in the pews, and if I can get people down to the altar, and if I can do this, and if I can do that, and I don't know how many men have built up a ministry of their own name for their own purposes. Instead of God. So all of a sudden now, you're building a wall, you're building a nice house, you're building a life, and it's untempered mortar. The clock is ticking on all of that. So verse 11, saying to them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, where is the daubing wherewith you have daubed it? Where's all that mortar at? What happened to the mortar that was holding these stones and these bricks together? What happened to your life? I, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen Baptist, born again, seemingly born again or whatever, I don't know, King James Baptist preachers put a gun to their head and blow their brains out. Why? Because apparently their life was built on a bunch of lies. Apparently. Uh, Lisa and I ended up, uh, we went to Dallas, Texas for a National Religious Broadcasters Convention with Southwest Radio. We went to a church down there and you could just tell it was a bad, bad Sunday. The pastor they had had just killed himself. And it was rough sitting there. I remember it. Lady brought, I've told this story before. A lady brought to me the, a pastor that her and her husband used to go to his church. And all of a sudden he came up missing. They went out looking for him. They finally found him. He had gone off in the woods somewhere and put a gun to his head and killed himself. And it was because it was just about to come out that he was sodomizing boys. His life was built on a lie. And you can make that look good for a while. You can cover it up for a while. But it won't last. When you are hiding sins that should be under the blood, you know only hide them for so long. You can only hide them for so long. Verse 14, so I will break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered. Now everybody sees what you were really made of to begin with. Man that I revered greatly, in fact I feared him because I thought he was way beyond me as far as personal holiness and Dedication and preaching and all this stuff. 
His church found him at the hotel with his mistress. And the elders and the deacons went to him and they said, don't even come by the church. We're going to box your stuff up and we'll bring it over here to your hotel room. Don't come back. And instead of, instead of repenting, you know what this man did? Left his wife, blamed his wife, blamed his children, his adult children, and ran off after this woman. Never to return again. See, that kind of stuff happens now. We don't like to talk about it. But that's the foundation. Apparently, that was the foundation of that whole man's life. And he did well to hide it for years. But in the end, it always gets found out. So, back in verse 14 again. So that the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall, and upon them that have daubed it, with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you one, maybe two questions, very quickly. Number one, would you like for God to expose the faulty, flawed foundations of your wicked life? The answer is no. Would you like for everybody who knows you to find out what you really are instead of what you pretend to be? The answer is no. The storms that God brings are there to do us a favor. God knows that you're the foundation of your life and what you have built in your life will not last. He knows it. And while you may think God is enacting some form of wrath upon you and he means to do away with you what really is happening is that God loves you and he is blowing these things away and destroying them so that you'll learn we're not going to do it this way again next time we're going to do it right you see I Maybe I'm different from a lot of preachers. In fact, I know I am. But I don't expect a whole lot out of people. I just... It's not to put anybody down. And that knowledge basically has come from me. I've learned not to expect a whole lot out of me. I try not to see people as they must be perfect because nobody's perfect but Jesus. In my younger days, I was full of arrogance, full of sin, and full of myself. And I felt like that I was superior to even the peers, the men that I had surrounded myself with in my Bible college days. That I was far superior to them in my walk with God and in my personal habits. But that was just a cover. That was just a cover up. So this morning, with the knowledge that God will, if He loves you, He will tear down the wall. And everything that you use to build it, he'll tear it down. And then he'll say to you in love, would you like to know how to build this the right way? 
And when you follow Him, you'll see that God's way was better than yours. And you'll surrender to it. And you realize that, Mike, the way things you used to do, the way you used to see things, the way you used to be, Mike, that was all wrong. And God will probably, in fact, I know He'll do it, have to do it again at some point. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I'm going to open up these altars once again. I, I don't want to discourage anybody from coming forward. I really don't. So I'm going to give you a minute. If maybe God's leading you to come down and pray. Spend a little time with Jesus. But this morning, you're going to say, God, let's tear it down before it gets too big, before it gets too high. Let's tear it down before I get too full of myself. God, let's tear this down. Let's start all over again and do it your way. God is good. God is good.